should pursue some interest in the cancer for women before, during, and after pregnancy. She received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School in 1996 and completed her internship and residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the Harvard Combined Medicine and Pediatric Residency Program. She completed her fellowship in general internal medicine at Harvard Medical School in 2003. Uh, Dr. Hoffman obtained her master's degree in public health from Harvard for public health. Her research interests include the influence of nutrition during pregnancy and early childhood and maternal and child health. She is co PI of Project Deva, a long term course study of pregnant women and their children. And she is a member of the Obesity Prevention Program in the Department of Population Medicine. Dr. Hoffman has published widely on predictors and sequel of maternal weight in the peripheral arterial including excessive gestational radiation and gestational diagnosis, breastfeeding and postpartum weight retention. She also led a number of studies examining the effects of toxic products in early life, some of them including the gestational relationship, including maternal consumption during pregnancy. In 2009, Dr. Hoffman was awarded the Rising Star Award by the Society of Pediatric and Perinatal Epidemiology Research, recognizing an early to care and that is expected to become research leader the field of reproductive pregnancy and pediatric epidemiology. She has a strong interest in research internship, works as director of the faculty development in the Department of Population Medicine, site director of the Harvard General Medicine Fellowship at the Department of Population Medicine. The cognition of her commitment to mental health, she received a Harvard Medical School Young Mental Award in 2011. It is a great pleasure that uh, we have introduced uh, Dr. Alton. Thanks for that great introduction, and, and I was telling Trevor that I think the invitation that I got to come here was the nicest invitation I've ever gotten, so it's been an incredibly warm and generous welcome. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming today. How, how are we doing from Savani? Everybody think you're okay? It's okay. Um, so um, I was asked to talk about whether the topic of whether pregnant women should eat fish, and um, because I'm a clinician and interested in public health, I really think even more broadly, you know, specifically, do we should we advise pregnant women to eat fish? Um, so I'll, I'll tell you right now the answer is yes. Um, but really, the harder question is how much, and what type, and what kind of evidence do we give, and how do we then convince um, or affect the advice that we give into actual positive behavior change? And so I'll spend a lot of time talking about the subtleties. Um, and I think the um, flip side is if if people aren't eating fish, we need to know what they're replacing it or what they're substituting it with. And so often the choices that people make are not only about what they do, but what they don't do. Um, so I'll just say that um, I think a lot of people in the room probably know a lot more about some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. And so please feel free to humor me as I go over some of the pieces. But I'm hopeful that nobody in the room knows a lot about these things. So hopefully there will be something new for everyone. Um, so why is it such a difficult question um, whether pregnant women should eat fish? And actually, even in the conversations that I've had with all the students and faculty I've been talking to today, even you who know so much about fish still had a lot of questions about what is right for pregnant women to do. And the answer is that there are really multiple perspectives that are um, coming together to influence the question of whether we should be eating fish. There's the issue of toxicant risk, nutritional benefits, and those both, both impact on the individual, but more largely we're with ecological impacts and economic influences that kind of influence what fish are available to, available to us and how they teach us and whether it's good for us to be eating fish. Um, so not only are these many um, perspectives kind of converging on this question of fish consumption choice, but also within each one, it's not entirely clear what the right thing is to do and which way the evidence is pointing us. Um, they're often in conflict with each other. And a lot of the advice that's been given has taken one or maybe two of these perspectives, but not all at once. And so when people go looking for the answer to the question, should I eat fish, they may come up with different answers depending on who they ask. And it's not always, I think, obvious to the individual looking to make the best health choice for themselves and their family and the globe, what is the, um, what is the underlying motivation for the advice that they're being given, because it's not always clear um, whether it's for their own health, the health Globe, the health of the person who's purveying the fish, etc. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about this issue of toxic and exposure and health risks. I'm not going to give up an extensive overview, but um, one of the primary concerns related to fish consumption is the issue of mercury. 
And we know that the main source of methylmercury exposure for human health comes from seafood. The reason is that mercury is a global contaminant. It's everywhere. It's in the oil, the, the air, probably the oil too, the air, <laughs> the soil, and the water. Um, and when it gets organified, it enters the food web and um, gets um, both concentrated and magnified as it enters the aquatic food web. And the aquatic microorganisms are the ones that organify the mercury. So the mercury that's largely in the air and in the water is non-organic and is not available to us and not as toxic as the organic mercury. So that's the reason that fish is really the primary source and as you go higher up the food web, mercury gets more concentrated because of the magnification and concentration. Okay, so um, when we think about the health effects of mercury, it's uh, become clear from a number of health studies that the organ of the human body that's most sensitive to the harmful health effects of methylmercury is the fetal brain. And so um, the evidence for this um, knowledge comes from a couple of really unfortunate episodes of poisoning that occurred, one in Iraq and one in um, Japan in the 50s to 70s. And what they found was that um, people were devastated by really high toxic levels of, of um, methylmercury exposure, but um, the fetus um, that was exposed in utero was especially affected. And women might have had very minimal or really no symptoms at all during pregnancy, but given birth to these babies that had devastating blindness, death, blind, deafness, cerebral palsy. And so this is sort of a famous photograph, but this is the mother who ate fish during pregnancy. She obviously looks completely fine, bathing her daughter who had prenatal methylmercury exposure, who, um, who was born you know, profoundly affected. Um, and so um, the question arose really in the decades later about, so these are poisoning and high levels of methylmercury exposure, but what about all the people that really rely on um, frequent fish consumption for their everyday diet, do we need to worry about the amounts of methylmercury that they're being exposed to? And are these levels having effects on human health? Not the kind, the obvious kind where you look at the babies with cerebral palsy and blindness and deafness, but other more subtle deficits that we can detect in public health studies. And so um, there were a few um, uh, studies that were marked upon in um, <coughs> communities that really relied on, on fish and had frequent fish consumption. One, um, was a longitudinal cohort study that was founded in the Faroe Islands, which are north of Scotland. There they eat a diet that's rich in seafood, including not only fish, but also pilot whale. Um, and the meat and blubber of the pilot whale is rich in mercury, but also PCBs and other persistent organic pollutants. Um, the, um, so people ate um, you know, about one to two fish servings a day in that community. And achieved hair mercury levels of about four parts per million, which is about, um, in, in the U.S., the average hair mercury is about a half a part per million, so it's about eight times as much as what we have, we have here. And in follow-up of these babies, followed since birth, there have been a number of studies which have shown detriments in motor function, attention, verbal tests, and, and nerve conduction. And these are completely normal appearing kids, again, but when you do these testing, you can find subtle deficits that are apparent in the babies that had higher <coughs> renal methylmercury exposure. <coughs> Around the same time, though, another cohort study was founded in the Seychelles where populations were really consuming general ocean fish but not marine mammals um, with very similar hair mercury exposure during pregnancy here, um, almost seven parts per million compared to uh, almost five in the pharaohs. Um, but in fact, in this study, there were no significant associations that were found on uh, the maternal prenatal fish consumption for general marine mammals. So, um, the, um, so these two studies really laid the groundwork for showing that prenatal fish consumption could cause potentially measurable deficits in populations with more moderate um, methylmercury exposure that weren't as obvious as the, as the toxic effects. Um, and but the one remaining question is, what about the kinds of lower exposure that most populations in the US are consuming? So we're not generally eating one to two fish meals a day, we're eating one to two fish meals a week in the US, or perhaps less. Um, and so a lot of my work started trying to understand what are the health effects of um, fish consumption in a lower fish consuming population. And so um, one of the um, avenues in which I've done my research is a longitudinal cohort study of pregnant women followed from birth who were in Boston area. They were eating about one fish serving a week. And we looked at um, child developmental testing at three years. And we found, lo and behold, that if you are in the top decile of methylmercury, and again, these women who were like general U.S. population had um, hair mercury levels at about half a part per million, so substantially lower. But those that were in the higher range had measurable decrements in um, vocabulary function and visual motor tests when we assessed the at age three. Um, so 
mod you know, modest deficits, um, nothing clinically obvious, but there was, again, some evidence of decrements with, um, with higher mercury <coughs> Um, but, you know, the, the question is really how much of an effect this has. And one of the, um, this is getting a little old now, but one of the efforts to really integrate across multiple studies, not including mine, but this was done before mine was published, to say, well, okay, so there are these measurable, measurable decrements, but how strong is the effect? And so they looked at the, uh, a study in, the, in New Zealand as well as in the Seychelles and Faroe Islands, and they found that, actually, interestingly, even though the Seychelles study was not significant, it was kind of in the same direction as these other two studies, which showed harm to methyl mercury. But the magnitude of the impact, at least on IQ, was only 0.18 IQ points for each part per million of hair. So pretty small um, magnitude of effect, even though it was quite easy to show that there is a measurable effect. Um, this is you know, not on the order of something like lead or other so um, regardless, um, because of the, um, <coughs> primarily based on the findings of the Fair Island study, um, the um, federal government reviewed the literature and um, considered that it was prudent to recommend that pregnant women should limit their fish consumption during pregnancy to protect the fetal brain. And so it came out with a federal mercury advisory in 2001, um, initially by the FDA and then ultimately supported by the EPA, which basically suggested that women who are pregnant, nursing mothers, and children under age 12 should avoid the, fish, the four fish types that are highest in mercury, whereby one meal of this fish would put you above the reference dose, or the recommended daily dose, and consume um, up to 12 ounces a week of all other commercial products. So where did this, so this came from, you know, measured mercury levels and, um, for, and relating to the reference dose and assuming sort of an average body weight of a woman. And, um, and so there's, there's a lot of science behind this, this advice. Um, where did the 12 ounces per week come from? I don't know. They kind of thought it was prudent. There's no, there's no calculation. There's no sort of muscle modeling. There's no, you know, uh, measurements that say that 12 ounces per week is the is the right amount. And there's not a lot of guidance within this really about what the 12 ounces a week should include. Right? Um, so um, not only is the literature, um, you know, it's it's fairly consistent, but not not of an extremely strong effect, I would say, of methyl mercury. But not only that, they, it, it's complicated by the fact that there are these other contaminants in fish. And so it's hard to know, is it the mercury, is it the PCBs, is it other heavy metals, is it other things that could get in the water, that could get in the fish, instead of other either additional health effects or that could actually be causing health effects if you're attributing to the methyl mercury. Um, and, and so it's hard to know not only how all these things um, individually affect human health, because many of them have been studied, but really how they come together. And so, you know, if you're eating a fish, you might be getting these package of contaminants. And all these studies didn't look at fish, they didn't look at multiple contaminants, although some of them didn't look at PCBs, they just looked at mercury levels, remember. Um, so it's, it's, it's complex to make decisions based on these advice. The other thing is that, actually, it turns out there's a, quite a range of methylmercury concentrations in fish. So um, swordfish, which is on the do not eat list, because on average, you're above one part per million of mercury in the swordfish on the market, but in fact, some sort of fish are, you know, have zero mercury. Um, and halibut, which is on nobody's list of something either to eat or avoid, so presumably you can, you know, have as much as you want. Um, on average, it's um, modest in mercury, but some individual fish can be above the level that is considered not to be safe. Um, also, there's um, variability not only, you know, within species, but also within particular <coughs> species by where it comes from. So tilefish, which is on the do not eat list, is only if it's from the Gulf of Mexico, but in fact, if it's in the Atlantic, it's likely to be well and mercury and absolutely fine to be. Um, but that is not really incorporated into the guidance. It's also a lot of, I think, variation and susceptibility to the toxicities of mercury that we just don't we just don't understand why some people are probably more likely to um, experience toxicity and not it's just not been looked at and is I think an area of emerging interest, but um, but we just don't know how to say that you are fine with mercury and someone else is likely to get into different um, but a lot of the attention in terms of trying to tease out the complexities of how much harm methyl mercury is likely to cause with TBD and seafood is compounded by the fact that there are these um, co-occurring benefits, uh, nutritional benefits that are in fish. Um, and so it has made it um, complicated to tease out really what's the effect of mercury and then what's the overall effect of fish. So um, one of the reasons that we're especially interested in the health benefits of fish are because of the omega-3 fatty acids, which are essential nutrients. So essential nutrients are those that we can't synthesize in our bodies, we can't make it, we have to eat it in our diet. Humans just can't, you know, can't make them out of nothing. 
Um, and we know that they are especially essential, uh, essential for optimal brain development. They're really important in the third trimester of pregnancy and in the first two years of life, and also for eye development. And we know that most women in the U.S. eat too little. So the recommendation is for about 200 milligrams a day of, of consumption of DHA, which is the primary marine fatty acid that's involved in neurodevelopment. Um, so 1,400 milligrams per week. Um, the average U.S. woman is eating about 500 milligrams per week, so about a third of what's recommended. Um, so what's the evidence that this is helpful? Well, when we look at fish consumption, we see benefits. There are studies for other health outcomes like cardiovascular disease, which I'm not going to talk about. I don't know about my data. That's just my data. Um, so it's showing that actually if you eat more fish, um, you have higher scores on um, those same two tests at age two years, a little bit higher on scores of the vocabulary test, and on visual motor abilities. And so more fish consumption is actually associated with better test scores in these kids at age three. This is the mother's consumption during pregnancy and the kids test scores at age three. We've looked at other populations um, and shown in um, the Danish National Forest Corridor, which is the 100,000 women in Denmark, that the women who are the highest fish consumers have the kids with better development through the toddler years. And another study um, led by Joe Hiblin looking at data from a cohort of kids in the United Kingdom found that the kids whose mothers never ate fish during pregnancy had the highest risk of failing tests. And this was kind of the other direction, it's bad to be high. So these kids, um, compared to mothers who ate more than two servings a week, which is more than the current recommendations, and those who ate one to two fish servings a week, which will be currently by those whose mothers never ate fish, were more likely to fail level IQ tests, high motor tests, social development, and low social development test. And the kids who did best were those that actually ate more than guidance currently recommends, not those who are within the current guidance. Um, so, so, you know, one of the um, ways to, that people try to approach it as well, it looks like fish and nutrients are really good for developing brains, and so maybe we should just take fish oil. And like, I think, is the case with so many supplements in the nutritional literature, when you see an association of uh, you know, fruits and vegetables with a health outcome, and then you say, okay, let's just take a vitamin and look at the same health outcome. You don't see the same benefit. So it turns out that studies that have um, randomized pregnant women to eat uh, fish oil supplements have generally not found evidence for substantial benefit for their, for their offspring. There are some small studies that have, the better, larger, you know, better designed studies have it. So this is a large randomized trial of about 1,500 women in Australia, um, and they were randomized to fish oil um, or placebo, and found that there was no difference in cognition in 18 months, no difference in language, although maybe a little lower language scores, no difference in motor, nothing in their adaptive behavior. So that, you know, the issue when we're looking at observational studies of fish consumption is maybe it's not the fish, maybe it's the women who choose to eat and there's something different about them that's also benefiting. Maybe they're more health conscious and they just have other healthy behaviors and there's no real benefit of fish, it's just confounded by the fact that they're not more healthy people. And so we do this trial and we say, okay, actually, whoops, there's nothing, there's no benefit of the fish oil supplements. Um, and, um, but we think they're taking it and it's working because the other health outcomes that have been seen to be related to fish oil supplementation during pregnancy are in the beneficial direction, so lower preterm births, lower thank you efficiency, and um, lower rates. Um, and um, another study, kind of similarly, much smaller numbers, but looking at a randomized trial of fish oil during pregnancy and child cognition at age seven, really nothing new, clear evidence for benefit over the long term. Although this study, I think, started out with 500 women and ended up with, you know, 140 um, at age seven. Um, so um, there's some concern that they, they didn't follow up all their kids. Um, so is it really just that it's confounded by the fact that healthier women are eating more fish and they have healthier kids, or is there something about fish that's different than fish oil that really seems to be conferring the benefit? Maybe it's the other nutrients in fish, the iodine and the vitamin D and the selenium. Um, there have been some studies looking at, not so much at cognition, but at like preterm birth, for example, where the benefit was even stronger in people who were eating lean fish compared to fatty fish. Um, it's also sort of hard to know what you know. How much omega threes are you getting from a fish? Is it um, is it enough? And there's actually a quite dramatic range. It's like mercury. There's a large range. So if you eat you know one six ounce meal of shrimp, you get 250 milligrams of DHA, which is, would be low if that was all the fish that you ate this week. If you eat one meal of salmon, you get about 2,500 milligrams, or 10 times as much. So one one meal a week would be completely adequate for your DHA needs. 
Um, and of course, there's this issue of the contaminants in the same fish. And so if we don't account for the contaminants, we might be getting a false sense of the, uh, underestimating the benefit. Um, so um, in some of the work that I've done looking at this, um, again, this is the Boston cohort, we were able to tease out the effects of mercury in fish. And this is um, evaluating kids at six months. And what we found were those that had the highest cognitive development scores at six months, those that had low hair mercury but were frequent fish eaters. And those that seemed to do the worst were those who didn't eat much fish that had higher hair mercury. And so just like you'd expect, it's better to be have all the good stuff but not as much of the bad stuff. Um, but the overall effect of fish consumption was still in the beneficial direction, even with even if you don't sort of consider mercury. So that was the six-month data. These are the three-year data. Uh, or sorry, these are the same six-month data. Um, so overall, fish is good for cognition in six months when you don't adjust for mercury. You get a stronger evidence for benefit when you account for the mercury. And the same thing with mercury. It looks like there's a harmful association um, with cognition in infancy that gets stronger when you account for good stuff that's in the fish. Um, so one, one approach that people have taken is, OK, let's just kind of add up the mercury and the DHA and try to say, like, can we just sort of mathematically or arithmetically really say, like, OK, these fish, lots of DHA, not that much mercury, though, those are in the good direction. Anything that's kind of below the line where you start having more risk of adverse health effects um, because the mercury outweighs the, the, risk, uh, the, the risk of the fish. This is completely just based on our data, I will say, that you know, what's the effect of mercury, what's the effect of DHA, how much mercury, how much DHA. But when we look at our data at eating fish, we actually still see you know, the overall effect of fish is beneficial, although we don't really have a lot of data on these um, higher mercury fish because a lot of pregnant women aren't eating. So that was one way of communicating. This is another way. You know, is it really that all this good stuff is good about the fish? Or is it just a little hypothetical mercury risk? So this is another way of communicating risk. Um, this cartoonist isn't that worried about, about mercury. Um, but um, you know, one of the things that I have learned more as I get more into this area, which I think is not news to anyone in this room, is that it's not just about individual health when it comes to fish. And I think we need to move the debate, which has really started to focus on this risk-benefit balance more broadly, to say, well, there are larger issues at play. And um, I probably don't have this <laughs> but, you know, eating fish may not be good for the ecosystem. We eat a lot of fish. We're eating more fish. The population is growing um, at a tremendous rate. And so even if everyone just eats the same amount of fish, there are just more people in the world. In, in um, 1950 compared to 2008, the population has more than doubled. And we are eating more fish, which is the um, these sort of dark blue bars up here, and then we're also using a lot more fish for things that don't involve our own consumption, like feed for animals and feed for aquaculture. And so combining those three things have really led to a dramatic increase in the amount of fish that we're eating, and not surprisingly then has led to um, declines in the populations of the fish, especially the um, large pelagic fish, which estimates suggest that they have decreased by 90% over the past 50 to 60 years, so things like tuna, um, for example, has really, um, you know, really, really markedly changed um, from the middle part of the last century. And the expectation is that if this protein demand continues to increase, that these, um, this situation may become more dire. And so it's not just the fish we eat, but then the damage to the other fish that we're not eating into the ecosystems. And so um, um, fishing methods like bottom trawling, which not only catch the fish that they catch, but then also destroy the habitat to affect the likelihood of um, repopulation have also had the effects on the fisheries. So even though we might think that on balance, really the evidence shows, at least for pregnancy, which is my focus here, that it's probably good for everyone to eat um, fish regularly and reduce a couple servings. If we all do that, that may not be enough fish for everyone. And I think we need to be able to communicate, you know, communicate that to, to people and figure out ways to solve this problem. Otherwise, it doesn't really help to give the advice that everyone should eat fish. So um, aquaculture um, is one um, approach to dealing with dwindling fish stocks. Again, I'm not. <laughs> this is much your more area than mine, but it also has its own ecological risks. I don't think it's um, unbalanced. Um, you know, I think it's a solution, but a solution that needs to be sorted out. Um, considering the harm, I'm just not going to get myself into trouble. <laughs> I don't think any more depth. <laughs> you all know more than I do. Okay, so um, so but when you try to sort of eat in an ecological sound way. I would say for the average consumer, it is really not at all straightforward. Even if you really want to go out and you want to be a good person and not 
you know, not be on the bad list. You want to stay away from the, the monarch. You know, if, how much money? Can I trim? I don't know. Can I trim from the U.S.? But I really shouldn't be an imported trim. Do you know when you're getting trim at Red Lobster where it's coming from and um, and how, just how much information you have? And you have to say it's U.S. trim. It may not be because there's a lot of mislabeling. And so it's really hard, I think, for people to act on these issues, even if they really want to. Um, it's not always available to the end, you know, that sort of consumer at the point. Um, and, um, you know, another part of this picture which has really um, uh, impacted my sense of how, how much influence it has is, you know, this issue of, well, you know, economics really has a, um, has a strong influence in how we as individuals make choices and then the choices that are available to us. So it turns out that people are terrible at balancing risks and benefits. They're just awful at it. Anything that's a risk, they will avoid even, to, even, even if they may get a benefit. And so um, one approach has been to really say, it's not the risk of mercury and the benefit of the nutrients, it's the risk of mercury compared to the risk of nutrient deficits. And if you phrase things like that, people actually make different choices than a risk versus a benefit. Um, it actually also matters which one you say first. If you talk about, you know, mercury is bad, but there are good fatty acids, people will avoid fish. If you say fish is really good for you, but avoid the ones that are higher in mercury, they will eat more fish. <laughs> and so, we have to think about how um, the brain is actually really not very good at weighing um, risks and benefits. And anything that's complicated, the great majority of people will just not, you know, will try to avoid a cognitive effort. They may take, they may do it once or twice, but they don't tend to do it in a sustained way. So if we can sort of influence, you know, maybe have people make some decisions to get into good habit, but they need to ultimately be in a group. Um, and there's also a lot of this, you know, taste and culture tradition and, and cost and people may just be constrained against making the choices that are the healthiest for themselves in the environment because they can't afford it or it's not available to them. And you know, we know that fisheries are a big business getting bigger <coughs> and though that money that's going to the fisheries is going into things like congressional lobbying and advertising and availability and influencing the fish that are in the markets and in the restaurants. Um, so. Um, we certainly don't want to, you know, take away the livelihood of all these people, um, but we also have to, sort of, you know, I've, I've been impressed at how much the fisheries industry has really tried to influence the debate. Um, so, for example, in the 2001 FDA advisory, apparently the initial version actually specifically mentioned tuna as a fish to limit, and then the tuna lobby met with the FDA, and then tuna was not mentioned in the, in the ultimate advisory, it was in the draft advisory. Um, and it, you know, it turns out that the FDA actually has, um, you know, two mandates. One is to protect the safety of the food, and the other one is to protect the food industry. And that is their sort of congressional mandate. And so they actually are in a little bit of a bind when it comes to these, um, you know, is there, um, who is their audience? Is it the public or is it the food industry? And it's both. Um, okay, so what do we do? What do we tell people? So we could um, just talk about risk and assume that, you know, if we talk, it's like avoid high mercury fish, we could assume that people will switch to lower mercury fish just to counteract that benefit. We could just, con um, and, and so I'll say that that risk, premier risk strategy is sort of what the initial federal advisory was about, mostly about risk. Um, we can also just communicate benefit only and other strategies, which I'll show you, have taken that approach and just say, eat fish, it's good for you. And then there's been a lot of concern that that would then lead for more people to increase their mercury consumption and um, potentially have health harms. Um, you could do the risk and benefit both, but then everyone just sort of cognitively shuts down and you know, can't deal with all that information, as we know from the economic literature. Um, we can do risk trade-offs, which maybe is a little bit better, but not that much better. We can sort of come up with these complicated algorithms to you know, say the um, balance, this one's better and this one's worse, but I think that people in general in the public, public don't have the patience in the time for that. Um, so that's what we could do. So what, so what is happening? What are we, how good are we at telling things to people? What do we know? So um, I think the students were given this paper. Um, we did, I did a, a qualitative study with pregnant women just to try to understand what these pregnant women were hearing. And what they had heard was a lot of confusion and a lot of advice to avoid fish. And so I love this quote, you know, that's the main thing I find confusing. So like salmon, that's a pretty big fish, so maybe we shouldn't eat it, but then maybe we should eat it because it's like higher mercury, but it's also higher good fats, so don't eat it, but no, do eat it. So this is what, this is what people are hearing. These are like, you know, the, uh, the educated elite in Boston thing. We have no idea what to do. Um, 
And we're scaring people, I think. And so I've actually gotten more than one, you know, email or phone call like this, dear Dr. Oaken, okay, I'm sorry to bother you, but my wife is a nephrologist and I'm a thoracic surgeon, there's a chapter. My wife is breastfeeding our two-month-old last night, had one meal with grouper in a restaurant. Not really, so this is a high burger fish. Should she stop breastfeeding? Nice. <laughs> so um, I think we need to kind of dial back the panic factor a lot and say, like, actually breastfeeding is really going to benefit your child's brain. We really have a lot of great data on that. And no, 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 don't stop breastfeeding. And one fish meal is very different than, you know, the way that the um, risk thresholds are calculated, which is to say, if you eat this much fish every day over your lifetime, you're likely to experience medical harm. It's not one fish meal in one day. Um, okay, so this is the federal mercury advisory that we saw earlier. So how good was it? So they said, you know, avoid the high mercury fish, but consume some fish. It's actually, in its text, it's not that bad, even though they start out with the avoid, but they do they do recommend that you should eat fish. So, so what actually happened? So we looked at our cohort of pregnant women, and it just so happened that we were recruiting from 1999 through 2001 when this advisory came out and for another year afterwards. And so we're actually, because we had measured not it, we're able to look at the total fish consumption in the population and then specific groups of fish, including canned tuna and dark fish. And when the advisory came out, fish consumption actually dropped off precipitously and then started declining over time, whereas it had been decreasing over time before. And we saw this decreases a little bit in tuna, um, you know, more dramatically in the dark meat fish, also in the light meat fish that really weren't specifically mentioned in anybody. Remember, Cantuna actually wasn't even in that initial advisory. So it looks like the effect of it was to decrease total fish consumption. And again, these are not big fish eaters, and to um, affect the number of women who were eating more than, you know, more than two fish, uh, to, to reduce the proportion of women who were eating more than two fish. Um, so that was one study in the Boston area. There's actually another great, um, getting more um, respect for economists over time. So this great economic evaluation where they basically got food purchase data from like food scanners and um, had data from over 15,000 households across the U.S. and they were actually looking at fish purchasing decisions before and after. And what they found was that, um, so the target consumers, so that's the women of childbearing age, they decreased their fish intake and they would decrease their mercury intake and also their omega-3 intake in the fish they were eating. But also, everyone else in the household, including the men and the kids, were eating less fish. And even the low consumers ate less fish. And they weren't especially avoiding high mercury fish. They were just eating less fish altogether. They didn't like switch for higher omega-3 fish. 50% of, um, <coughs> there was a 50% decrease in the proportion who were eating more than 12 ounces a week and a 60% increase in those who are eating no fish at all. Um, and so it looks like um, from our data, national data, like pregnant women after this advisory actually change their behavior, which is something because many advisories do not affect any behavior change. Um, but it's not clear that the um, way that they change their behavior, which was not in substitution of higher for low mercury fish, but really about decreasing the fish intake was really helping public health. So, so that was sort of the government's best effort, but it's really you know complicated by the fact that so they're saying eat up to 12 ounces a week. At the same time, we have a group of nutrition experts who come out with advice which says eat a minimum of 12 ounces a week. So I think when people see these completely diametrically opposed recommendations, they this is when they tend to throw up their hands and say, like, I don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do anything. Um, the press, I think, has not been. Of course, they like. You know, bad news more than good news in the press. So if they're going to talk about the health effects of fish, they're going to talk about the risks, not the benefits, nearly as much. And so if you read the papers, you hear more about the health risks and benefits. Um, but they're actually, not only are they kind of differentially um, inclined to talk about health risks, but they get it wrong a lot of the time. So this actually was a um, story that came out in the New York Times a few years ago, and it had a lot of press. It was about if you eat sushi at these high-end Manhattan restaurants, can't even eat one meal of sushi or you will be toxic, you know, intoxicated with mercury. So first of all, who are most of the people eating sushi? It's not pregnant women, I hate to say. It's like middle-aged businessmen. And did anyone say anything in this guideline about men? No, no, there's no, there's, there's, not, there's not federal guidance about mercury levels of fish for non-childbearing people. So there was a big kerfuffle around, just a lot of press, but oops. And so it just happened that I was preparing a talk the next week, and so I went to like get this headline and read it, looking back a week later. And uh-oh, you wouldn't have noticed this if you hadn't just happened to be looking back. They got it wrong, they did the math wrong, and they, um, they thought that the reference dose was per week, but it's actually per day. So they said, if you eat one sushi meal per week, 
you know, you'll be over the threshold. Actually, you could eat that sushi meal every day for a week. Then you know, <laughs> totally different thing. <laughs> Multiply by seven. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's error. I think we're getting better. You know, this is for a more recent figure from the Washington Post that I saw like, not that long ago, which really tries to have more of the subtlety and say, like, okay, there are these, you know, there's an axis of omega threes and there's an axis of mercury, and so having providing a little more information for how to choose. I think the press is not always bad, and there was communication I kind of like this one. Um, but um, most of the um, messages that I've seen when we went looking to look at sort of what are what are people telling, what are different public health agencies and not-for-profits telling women um, is only part of the picture. And actually Washington State is one of the better ones in terms of addressing all the domains. So it's you know contaminants, nutrients, ecological impacts, economic influences, and then also recognizing that there are these different target populations. And it's different if you're a pregnant woman than if you're, you know, a 25-year-old man or a 6-year-old man because your heart health, um, which I didn't really talk about much here, is just very different in those populations. And so, um, yeah, you guys did really pretty well. A lot of them, you know, only address just one little piece of it. And so if you go looking for advice, depending on what you see, you may walk away with a very different message about what's the right thing to do. Okay, so what do we know? So we can't, you know, just say eat less fish or eat less mercury. That doesn't seem to have an effect that's really helping, you know, public health. Um, we sort of want to talk about risks and benefits, but we know that it's really hard to process all this complex information, and then they're just, they're just not good at balancing risks. And even risks versus risks is difficult, and it may be that we need a different approach depending on what your target population is. So it sounds like um, a really complicated message, and I think that there has been a lot of concern about really trying to communicate a nuanced message about the issue of fish consumption, that it's not going to work. Um, so, but I thought that we might be able to do that. And so we did, um, we, we, uh, a year or two ago, we did this study where we tried to say, could we get pregnant women who are not eating fish and get them to eat fish but not eat more mercury and get them to kind of eat the kind of fish that we want them to eat? And um, the reason, I mean, I, I think there are two populations that we're targeting. One is the really frequent fish consumers who are eating a lot of high mercury fish and we want them to eat less of the mercury. And then, and that's actually a fairly small proportion, something like maybe 10% or less of the population. And then there's the women who are not eating enough fish and we want them to get more DHA, and probably not from supplements, because supplements don't seem to work that well. So we want them to eat more fish, but we just don't want them to then get in trouble with their mercury. And that's like, you know, a third and a half of women. And I thought, let's go for the, <laughs> the big group, not the small group. Um, and a lot of the effort is already focused on that other thing. So we did this, um, this is a pilot study where we um, created messaging um, that um, actually encouraged fish consumption in these populations. And when, um, when we originally conceived of this, I think we really thought about, you know, having a sort of fish is good, mercury's bad, balance, balance, balance. But when we talked to women, and the more I really understood actually, that they had gotten all these negative